Okay, well, as I said before, um, I'm Liesl from Mitcham Village Kindy. An interesting situation to be in talking about early childhood to primary school or secondary school um, educators and, and workers because for me, whenever I'm doing anything about education for sustainability, I take on a, a concept or a theme or something up here and I have to bring it right back down to early childhood. So I feel like, and to the sort of building blocks that are accessible to children of four and five. So I feel like um, as I talk this afternoon, you need to take what I'm taking and think about, you know, where it comes from up here. So it's kind of the reverse of, of what I do. So whenever I think about education for sustainability, my starting point is always, so what is it that comes after just having a veggie garden and separating your bins? So yeah, sure, most people do that, but we can do it so much better and take it so much deeper than that with, with all children. So I believe our role as educators is to honour a child's right to know, to respect their capacity to understand and to support their desire to implement change in their lives. So we know that from the age of three, which is pretty young, children are able to understand, question, and play an active role as members of their community. So they do this within their families and within their broader communities. And that they grow in response to what's made available to them. So I see our challenge as educators is to provide transformative and deep learning pathways and to become conduits for these children's change and action in their own lives. So children need learning around EFS contextualised. They need to be hands-on and they need to feel that they're making a contribution. So some of the um, images that I'm showing you are from this year and some are from last year. So last year we took on the Go Green Challenge, which I adapted quite a lot to be relevant to children of this age group and I was in communication with Robin around that. So we had the tree idea but we actually had a big branch and we attached little leaves that the kids cut out and things like that to the tree. And things like, you know, this rubbish. So we went on a, a creek walk and the director at the time wanted kids to pick up in a little paper bag a stick, a leaf, and of something else. Um, and so I, with the little group that I was walking with, saw some rubbish and I said to the kids, do you know what's gonna to happen to this rubbish? So we talked about this. So they came back with all this rubbish instead of a little bag <laughs> with a stick and a leaf and a something else. And that kick-started a great thing with them, a great sort of learning experience. And, and here, you know, we buried um, plastic in dirt and we've got some in water and we keep getting it out and having a look. Last year we actually buried it in the ground. <clears throat> this year we've, we've done it this way and the kids keep going, well, it's still there. It's still it hasn't disappeared. Um, and the water, you can see at the back there, there's some jars of water. We keep revisiting all of that. So I think that when we deliver really grim news about rubbish in the environment, we need to let children feel empowered so we need to provide them with ways that they can make a difference. So I took, I, I asked all the kids to collect rubbish over one weekend, which they did. Um, and I collected rubbish on my walk home just on one day and we put all this rubbish out. And the reason this little boy is standing out the front there with me is because he went to Sydney with his family in the holidays and he brought back from Sydney in their suitcase on the, on the plane some rubbish for me from Taronga Zoo. It was just magnificent. And you can see here with our wipeout waste little things and you know they all made those and loved them and took them home and filled them up. Um, and so another example, so this is just from a couple of weeks ago, you know, we talk about separating the rubbish. So why do we do that? What can we do with all of that? And we've, you know, had a great sort of plastic free July. And this is just an example of how I try and bring things down to their age groups. So I was trying to explain 
lengths of time, which you can imagine for four and five year olds is a really tricky concept. So you can't, you can't read it here, that's when it's all up on a wall display, but it was by the time it's spring, the newspaper and paper will have broken down. By the time, oh, while you're still at kindy, the fruit and vegetable scraps will be broken down and into con compost. When you're at primary school, that's how long it will take for that. And then on to when you're a grandparent, when you're an old lady, grandma or grandpa, and then, you know, never, 400, 500 years or never. And so the kids separated all this rubbish into all these different groups and things like that. And so they have this, the, you know, the catchphrase is, is this rubbish forever or is this, you know, recyclable? Um, just a couple of gorgeous quotes. So someone put plastic in the compost and look, it didn't break down. Um, and last year when we buried the rubbish and it hadn't disappeared and, you know, having images like this around so that the kids can actually see what goes in which bins and um, making it very visual for them. Um, so intentionally including EFS in everything, so in story times, in songs, in viewings, in play scenarios, um, and just how important it is to provide um, different entry points for children, but also to uh, accommodate all forms of intelligence. So if you think about those who are going to learn best from watching Peppa Pig's compost episode, or Paw Patrol saves the ocean or something like that. Um, so, you know, I've sourced some shows like that, but then there are those who, you know, just are engrossed by my felt story of the seagull that picks up all the rubbish on its leg. I think it's just called seagull actually. Um, and then there'll be those who, who want to do jigsaw puzzles or those who want to get out and actually learn outside. So there's just so many children's types of styles of learning that we need to accommodate. Um, and so many ways it can be integrated into curriculum. So as soon as we start, you know, a focus that the children are interested in, my brain goes to how can I include EFS and how can I connect it to Aboriginal knowledge and culture. So we had this great interest in insects um, and it just went on and on and on. And of course bees became a huge one. So it led into biodiversity and and plastic alternatives. So we had this beautiful thing of honeycomb, which uh, is in a box about that big, and we've finally eaten it this week after several months. Um, so just put that out there as a provocation. Like, what's this got to do with, um, with reducing plastic? And so the kids are looking and thinking, and they knew about bees' wax, and they'd eaten some, and they'd got the wax in their teeth, <laughs> and then we made wax wraps. So every child made a wax wrap with me and they, you know, come to kindy so excited. This this little boy here ran out straight away when his was cool and got his um, his Chinese dumplings and tipped them out of a reusable container into his wax wrap because he was so proud of it. Um, and then heightening their awareness, this is another thing I, I really feel very strongly about. And there's a fabulous um, author, Chowler, I think her name is, um, who believes that the most important thing is to actually reconnect children with the environment. Because how can we ask children to have strong feelings for protecting something if they're disconnected from it anyway? And so um, this year we've started an ongoing project um, with the creek across the road, about 200 metres walk. And so we just go over spontaneously and the learning that has unfolded and the kids' sense of ownership um, of, but, but not ownership of it, but responsibility for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they notice things and they come back and they tell me things, you know, like there's water in the creek now and there was a branch that fell down and there's birds in the hollows in the trees and, and all of that. Um, and I believe that that connectedness brings with it um, you know, a great sense of, of responsibility and care. Um, the other thing I do a lot is integrate EFS with Aboriginal knowledge and culture um, and just drawing children's attention to uh, the implications of the way we live 
and the very vast difference between, I, I focus mostly on Ghana, of Ghana um, people's ways of interacting with environment. And so this little activity here was um, uh, looking at habitat, so four different uh, little creatures that were sitting there and they had to sort of think about and work out where the different little creatures would go. And um, I organised, um, uh, over about the last year, I organised a children's Ghana tour of the city of Adelaide with Uncle Frank Wanganeen. And so these photos were for our, from the inaugural tour. Um, and the, uh, it, we visited three um, significant sites for um, Ghana people in, in the very heart of the city. And so one of the things that we did leading up to that was a lot of looking at different things like caring for country. And that has a huge um, EFS um, aspect to it, exploring habitat destruction and species decline on Garawira Pari. So this game here was about um, the, the predators and the native grasses and, and um, Pingo, the bilby. And now there's, of course, no more bilbies on, at Pinky Flat um, on Garawira Pari. So, and connecting all of those sorts of things. Oh, I seem to have that one again. Um, so looking at really, you know, some of the more challenging concepts, like even, um, uh, you know, this sort of thing, looking at um, uh, food miles and these sorts of things, you know, so long as we give it in manageable chunks and in creative ways, I believe even you know, four and five year olds can take that on board. You know, the very confronting things about what is happening to our environment. Um, so this one here, map drawn by Ziva, so who went to school with Ali, massive map about as big as one of these tables she drew me of, of the world. And we were looking at, at food miles and talking about what happens. and. The kids started doing this themselves of lining up the petrol bowsers. So they're tiny little images of petrol bowsers. So I'd taken photos at the supermarket and also the central market of, um, you know, like garlic from somebody or somewhere or other. And, you know, you can buy things that we eat every day, but that come grapes from somewhere or other else. And so we were looking at how far it had to travel. You can see there's a little aeroplane down here with this boy in a little truck. So, you know, it had to fly across the ocean and then it had to get to Australia and then it had to drive around Australia to get down to Adelaide. Um, so the kids took that on board. And one little girl said, well, look how much petrol it took when she grows it in her own backyard. Um, the child's voice, just amazing. This was just this week. She said to me, Lisa, when I grow up, I'm going to be a sea scientist and I'm going to learn about octopus and make sure they don't get caught in plastic bags. So that was just beautiful. And so she drew it for me here, this octopus in the plastic bag. And this is her as a sea scientist. And this was last year. So the, um, I think the visual demonstrations I had around of creatures in plastic bags, like our toys that we play with all the time, the dugong and um, some birds and things like that in plastic bags around the room really hit home. So someone needs to get that plastic bag quickly or the ladybird will get trapped. So that was another beautiful, a beautiful one. Um, something I believe Absolutely. While a four-year-old's impact on a global crisis may be slow, small scale and imperfect, it's the ongoing culture of change that is significant. Um, and yeah, I just can't stress how strongly I believe that. So yes, this child might have picked up a couple of pieces of plastic in Sydney and brought it home in his suitcase, but that's like a small building block. It made his mother's think you know, they didn't used to recycle or do anything. And they're going, well, actually, this is our four-year-old saying to us, this isn't okay, this doesn't belong here. This is gonna go down the drain or, you know, the elephant might eat it or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's all these, these small things. Yeah, and just uh, the powerful voice that children have in their households is, I think, something that we have to tap into.